Comrades, I can reassure you, first of all, that despite the title, I'm not actually going to try and deal with the entire history of the human race for the last thousand years. In this, I know, uh, disappointing, but uh, I'll touch on themes that might touch on some of the things that have happened since the year 1000. Um, I'll tell you why it's that year uh, shortly. Um, what I want to do is really do four things. One is to make a distinction between political and social revolution that I think is extremely important for what's currently happening um, in the revolutionary wave that's currently going on in the world since 2011. Then I want to make a, an analysis of distinctions between different kinds of social revolution. Um, and then I think a third thing would be to look at the ways in which two of those, the bourgeois and proletarian revolutions, have overlapped the problem of permanent revolution and its deflection uh, during the 20th century. And then finally, look at what I think the situation is, drawing on some of that discussion, uh, and, and basically conclude that what we seem to be faced with now is a situation either uh, in which uh, proletarian revolutions will be successful, uh, or will be faced with an endless series of merely political revolutions, of kind of adjustments, if you like, to existing uh, bourgeois regimes and states. Um, is this thing working, actually? Do well, I just speak louder? Is that kind of... Okay. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. First of all, then, let's think about what social revolutions, political revolutions actually are. Um, up between about 1789 and 1848, the kind of dominant position on the left was that there hadn't been any social revolutions. That all the revolutions, including the French, had simply been political revolutions because they'd left ruling classes in place and they hadn't transformed the state. It was Marx and Engels who actually introduced the concept of social revolution in the late, mid to late 1840s. And really, by working backwards, they're saying, we want a socialist revolution, but wait a minute, the bourgeoisie seem to have done something like that themselves, and kind of then read back into history this notion of a social revolution happening in Holland, or the Netherlands, um, England, and France. The distinction between political and social seems to me to be this. Uh, both are concerned with the state, but in different ways. Political revolutions are about uh, seizing control of the state, of the groups who do that. Social revolutions are about transforming the state completely in a way that's actually tied in with a social economic transformation from one mode of production to another. Now what that means, basically, is that in history there have been very, very many political revolutions, going all the way back to the origins of democracy in Greece uh, in, in, in the pre-Christian era and so on. Um, but there have been very, very few social revolutions. In fact, there's only been three, uh, and one of them hasn't happened yet. So we're actually in a bit of difficulty, thank you, we're in a bit of difficulty here uh, thinking about uh, examples and uh, history and so on. The three uh, I'll come to in a minute, but let's say a bit more about what uh, political revolutions uh, actually are. They seem to me to be situations where there's a struggle for power within the state, but within an existing ruling group, ruling class. And there may be different sections of it, but ultimately the same mode of production is going to prevail at the end. Now, that doesn't mean that there, there can't be mass popular intervention in these kind of revolutions. That, you know, social in that sense, there's actually demonstrations, riots, whatever. Um, and it doesn't also mean that there can't be social reforms coming out of it, like the introduction of certain forms of democracy or um, land reform or whatever. But in the end, the same mode of production will prevail, and this seems to be the, the classic defining feature of a, of a political revolution. Social revolution, on the other hand, is a revolution which either initiates or consummates the transition from one mode of production to another. Now, I say either because you cannot make generalizations about social revolutions. They're all actually quite different from each other, with a certain overlaps uh, at the edges, but they are all quite different. So you can't just make generalizing statements about the nature of the state. In some cases, um, a, a social revolution will kick, op will kick off a transformation period. In some cases, it will end it. And so in that case, you've got to look at the specifics of which ones we're talking about. If you think about um, the first of the, the social revolutions, the, uh, the, uh, the transition from slavery to feudalism, it's a very prolonged process, and at the end of it, you actually get the construction of a state, the perfected uh, feudal state with the three orders and all the rest of it built in. This, this is why the year 1000 is quite important, because that's when this happens. Um, but socialist revolution is going to be quite different. Then you'll start with a seizure of state power, transformation of the state, and then begin the process of building socialism. So you cannot, I think, generalize about social revolutions in any kind of glib kind of way. You have to look at the cases. Now, a couple of points I want to make about the overlap between political and social revolutions. Um, one is that there's a problem, I suppose, uh, in that if you look at certain individual revolutions, thinking particularly here about 1688 in England or 1776 in America, they look like political revolutions. They don't look like very significant events at all. But if you see them as part of a process, a longer historical process, then you can see they are parts of social revolutions. 
1688, if you take it in line with 1640, 1649, you see that as an entire historical period, that the period of social revolution. In America, 1776, not desperately significant in itself, I think, but if you connect that to the American Civil War and see that as a process, then you can see that entire period as one of social revolution. So that's the first thing, that can be used kind of overlaps. The second thing is, and this is very important for what's currently happening uh, in the Middle East and what has happened really since 1978, I think, is sometimes political revolutions are failed social revolutions, failed socialist revolutions specifically. And this is something you can trace all the way back to Germany in 1918, 1919. You have a revolutionary movement, it gets rid of the Kaiser, it gets rid of all sorts of you know, hangovers from feudalism, it gets rid of all sorts of obstacles to democracy and so on, but it doesn't actually end up achieving socialism. All it does is rearrange the ruling class or elements of the ruling class in Germany. And that's by and large been the outcome of most revolutionary upheaval, certainly in the West, um, since, since the First World War, think about Portugal and so on, um, and, or in the East in terms of Iran. We have the possibility of a socialist revolution, but it ends up just being a political revolution because that's the outcome um, and, 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 a, and a reconsideration of who the ruling class actually are. So that seems to be something that we need to think about because that's that, in some sense that's the most common outcome um, and, that, and the common set of relationships here. Finally, I just want to say something about class struggle uh, in relation to social revolution. And here I think we have to understand there are, in a sense, two kinds of class struggle. There's class struggle within a particular kind of social system, and there's class struggle between contesting social systems. This is putting it very schematically. But you can have, in feudalism, struggles of the peasantry against the law, so that happens all the time. But the peasants don't necessarily have the power to introduce or transform society or introduce a new society. And in fact, that, that rarely, in fact, ever, has happened. So not all classes have the same capacity for actually transforming society or for, or for remaking it. Slaves don't, peasants don't, or most peasants don't. Um, so, you know, <laughs> although they can engage in class struggle and did, it didn't mean that was going to be the basis of some new form of society. That's, so you can have class struggle within a society without it actually necessarily leading to anything else or any kind of transformation. And then you have the struggles between potentially different kinds of society, and here the obvious case is the bourgeoisie and its struggle against feudalism. Um, and here you have, in a sense, two different kinds of exploiters engaged in struggle. To exploiting classes engage in struggle here. Now, that's something you don't often think about, but obviously that's true. And if you don't think about it that way, then what you end up doing, certainly in terms of the bourgeois revolution, is looking for revolutionary artisans and peasants and workers and so on as the revolutionary class. But in fact, actually, it's the bourgeoisie themselves who are, in a sense, the, the class who's really engaged here in the struggle for, um, for power. So, okay, so those kind of remarks, you can think about the great social revolutions and how different they all are. But, but then there's a number of ways where you could think about this. But in terms of agency and consciousness, and clearly the first one, the, um, the transition from slavery to feudalism, is a very long, largely socio-economic process. It isn't a revolution in the, in the sense that we would generally recognise it, and it takes a very long time. Uh, and the people who do it, the people who carry it out, the people who are actually the class who re-emerge at the other end in some new social formation are, to a very large extent, the people who are the ruling class under slavery, except they've now transformed themselves into, into uh, feudal lords as opposed to slave owners. Um, they're also joined, in a sense, by the, the chiefs of the barbarian uh, tribes and so on. But nevertheless, it's, it's a transformation of the ruling class, a self-transformation of a very prolonged period of the ruling class into a different kind of ruling class. Now, it's not, a new, it's not an upsurge from below that, that, that kills them or removes them or, or whatever. And there's elements of this too uh, in the bourgeois revolutions, where in, to, to a very large extent, in Scotland and Prussia and Italy and Japan and so on, the people who actually make the revolutions are sections of the old ruling class, sections of the old order. Now, clearly there are questions here of timing. And in terms of agency, um, the, the, the bourgeois revolutions are particularly confused um, set, of, uh, set of events, because in some cases, where capitalism is highly developed already, which was the case in the Netherlands and in England, in a sense, the people who make the revolution don't have to be particularly connected with the capitalist system directly. In fact, they very rarely were. They can be inspired by mostly religious views or views about democracy and so on. But because capitalism is already developed to a very large extent, all they need to do is smash the carapace of the absolutist state and let capitalism develop freely. And this largely is what happens. Um, you have to establish some kind of state that, that will allow legal um, controls and so on to, 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 to allow um, capitalism to function. But by and large, you're, you're putting a cap on something that's already been established. In other, other cases, mostly those in the middle of the 19th century, you have a situation where Actually, capitalism hasn't developed very much at all. And in those cases, you often get people of the old ruling order saying, we have to make the transformation now, or else we're going to get overtaken by our, our more efficient competitors in Britain and France and so on. Uh, and this is clearly what, what detonates the thing in Germany. 
uh, in Italy and, and Japan, uh, and slightly later in Turkey. Now, so does the bourgeoisie play any role here? Well, with you, and I think we have to be clear about who the bourgeoisie actually are. There is a debate, um, particularly within political Marxism, as Robert Brenner and his, his followers, that makes a very, very hard distinction between capitalists and the bourgeoisie. You know, capitalists are people who engage in economic relations with capital. The bourgeoisie don't necessarily have anything to do with that. Now, I think this is wrong, and I think the way we have to look at it is actually to see the class we're talking about as being the bourgeoisie, and the capitalists are a small part of it, a kind of central part of it at the core, the economic core. But the bourgeoisie, as a revolutionary class, were never factory owners, or bankers, or industrialists, or large landowners. They were people who were far more peripheral to the revolutionary process, and far more peripheral to the actual economic processes of capital. Think about the French Revolution, which is the classic example. What, what were the leaders? Mostly they were lawyers, or in some cases doctors, in one case a priest, or journalists. You know, these are not central figures in the kind of operation of how, of how capital works. And in fact, it was precisely because of this that they were actually able to lead a revolutionary movement. If you're a factory owner, you don't really want your workers going off joining barricades and shooting each other and burning buildings and so on. It's a bit destructive of business. Um, but if, you, you know, if you're not centrally concerned with the economy in that way, you can lead in a way that, that actual capitalists can't. And you can also connect much more closely with the petty bourgeoisie in a way that actual capitalists can't. So this is why, I mean, I think of the French leaders only, Roderay was actually a capitalist. He was actually a glass manufacturer, which is quite a good thing to be in the middle of a revolution. When you think about it in terms of <laughs> the number of windows that must have been smashed in Paris in 1792. But I mean, you know, he's a very, a very exceptional character. Now, that, this is important. It has importance for what happened in the 20th century. Because one of the things I want to argue is actually most of the people who led the third world revolutions in the 20th century were pretty much the same kind of people as the people who led the French Revolution and the revolutions around about that time. In the sense, they were not uh, closely connected directly with, with, with capitalist economy, but were part of the bourgeoisie in that sense. Anyway, I'll return to that, that point. So, the difficulty for us and for the revolutionary movements of the last century, really, has been that the bourgeois revolutions and the socialist revolutions have overlapped. And this was a problem that Trotsky was trying to deal with in the concept of permanent revolution. Um, the possibility of can we move from a situation where there hasn't been a bourgeois revolution and go beyond it immediately, or in a very short order, towards socialism without, as it were, going through the stages of development so beloved of social democracy and later of Stalinism itself. And his answer was, in the Russian case, and then extended to the rest of the world, was yes, of course, we can, if there's a working class which is, um, which is militant, which is organized, which is politically awakened and so on, as there was in Russia, if you've got that, then you can actually do this. And he thought that the bourgeoisie would not in themselves be able to play this uh, a revolutionary role. They were too tied into imperialism, uh, or they were too terrified of the working class, or indeed of the peasants, um, in the revolutionary case, and therefore they had ceased to be a revolutionary class uh, in the way in which they had been, say, in the time of the French Revolution. Now, there's an extent to which I think that is actually wrong, and has been proved to be wrong in the, in the 20th century. Um, which doesn't mean that permanent revolution as a theory is, is wrong, but it means that one element of it has to be looked at again. Uh, it seems to me to be untrue to say that uh, the bourgeoisie, as I've defined it, has not played a revolutionary role, and it clearly has in large areas of the third world. Now, again, I'll come back to this, this point. So, however, we could have, we could say there was a point at which the bourgeois revolutions came to an end and the socialist revolutions should have begun. And we can date this with some precision actually. Uh, it was about 9 o'clock in the evening of the 8th of November um, in 1917, a new style, when Lenin rose to address the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets at the Shmoldy Institute for Noble Girls and said, as I'm sure you all know, we will now begin to construct the socialist order. Now at that point, that doesn't mean that every single place in the world, like Afghanistan or something, was, was immediately going to leap towards socialism. What it meant was there was now the possibility of a path of development of freedom and socialism that did not involve having to go through the bourgeois revolution and endless periods of capitalist development. It meant the possibility had now arisen for, for a different way, a different path to, to be followed. Now, unfortunately, as we know, that didn't happen. And so something else happened instead. And what actually happened was that effectively you got a rerun or a continuation of the bourgeois revolutions in the modern form, in the only form in which they could actually have taken place at that point. All we have got left? the only form they could have taken place at that point. Now, in our tradition, we tend to talk about this as being a process of, sorry? No, not so good, okay, well, I think I can make that. Um, we, we tend to talk about this as a process of deflection. You know, the, the proletarian revolution is deflected. And this follows from a, a very important uh, seminal article by Cliff 
um, from 1963. Now, however, I think there are some difficulties with this uh, as well, um, and again, these are pertinent to our current concerns. Uh, first of all, Cliff says that Trotsky is right that the bourgeoisie isn't a revolutionary force any longer, um, but the people who have, as it were, substituted are what he calls the revolutionary intelligentsia. Now, this is a term of art, I think. Um, I'm not entirely sure how Nasser or Manjitsu would count as revolutionary intelligentsia, but even take the thing at its face value. Um, actually, if you look at who the people who led the Third World Revolutions were, they're pretty much the same kind of bourgeois figures as led the revolutions in the late 18th and early 19th century. Guevara was a doctor. Um, Arafat was an engineer. Um, Cabral was a kind of merchant's clerk who worked for some idiot Portuguese colonialist in Guinea-Bissau and wrote some very pungent pages saying how badly treated he felt a man of his talents having to work for these idiots you know, when he should be running the show. You know, this is a classic bourgeois response to colonial or aristocratic um, blocks and their ability to, to progress. They're exactly the same kind of people. Now, and of course, they were built into a much more state capitalist type of developmental project, but essentially they're the same class, the bourgeoisie in the broader sense that we've talked about. So it's not true to say that they haven't, the bourgeoisie hasn't played a kind of revolutionary role. It has in the third world. I mean, obviously, we're not talking about Europe or America, but, but in the parts of the world where it hadn't been accomplished, they still played this role. They played this role on one, one proviso, of course, and that is that the working class wasn't capable or wasn't able to, to, to wage a revolution on its own behalf. Now, that um, is interesting because in quite a lot of cases in the third world, there was no working class revolutionary movement to actually act as a kind of counter to this. And this is important because the, the, there's a sense in which um, deflection suggests a kind of trajectory which is bumped off course. But if there is no working class revolution in the first place, then what's being deflected? In a sense, in that space, in that gap, if there is no struggle from the working class, and, and I don't just mean strikes and so on, I mean actual revolutionary movement, it is possible for the bourgeoisie to play its old role uh, and, and not to actually have to worry about the possibility of, of workers um, uh, coming to power. The thing that's actually interestingly missing from Cliff's entire argument is any conception of an even and combined development as the possibility, as the conditions which actually set off working class struggle in the third world. And it's partly because in not every country in the third world is that true. Um, in some places there wasn't an even combined development to the extent that actually it was in Russia or in China where it actually created very intensive um, working class presences which were able to enter into a revolt in this kind of way. In lots of parts of Africa that wasn't true, for example. Um, finally, you have to look at um, outcomes. And here again, I think there's an issue about um, what exactly is being deflected. It's certainly the case in China that there was a massive working class revolutionary movement which was defeated and into that gap um, stepped Mao and the kind of state capitalist proto-bureaucracy, state bourgeoisie that, that eventually took power in China and is now uh, since returning to its private uh, capitalist uh, base of the reforms since 1978. Um, but in other countries there weren't. There weren't revolution. There wasn't a revolutionary movement in Cuba, a working class movement in Cuba. And Cliff actually talks about this in his article. Um, it was, you know, there was no mass movement. There was two, a struggle between two sections of the bourgeoisie, one of which the one led by Castro and Guevara actually won. Um, now, in that sense, you have to therefore, you're talking about two different things. You're talking about one situation where there's actually a bourgeois revolution still to be made. That was the case in China. And others, you're simply talking about a political revolution, a struggle between sections of an existing capitalist class, different sections of it, for power. So what does that mean for us uh, now? I think... Permanent revolution, um, in the sense of which we know it in its classic sense, is probably over in that there is no longer a bourgeois revolution to take place. And if you have no longer a bourgeois revolution, then you can't really pass from one kind of revolution to another. And more, uh, I think the way in which we tend to use the term is actually about the possibilities of, of events or revolution starting for democracy or for political liberty or for land reform or for some of the other, some other less than revolutionary struggle, but something that, that starts off demanding reforms and then moves on to a greater revolutionary upsurge and the possibility of that happening. Now, that's certainly true, but that's, oh, that's true of every revolution, <laughs> including things like the English Civil War and the Dutch Revolt. I mean, you know, they all started as reforms as well, then moved on towards, um, towards greater revolutionary upheavals. So in a sense, that's not very specific to our current period, simply to talk about the possibility of moving from reform and, 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 and struggles around about reform objectives towards revolutionary objectives. So I think that we have to to think about other things here, it seems to me that 
Well, one other thing, actually. One, one other argument that gets made, and, and Joseph Chinara made this uh, against me uh, recently, is the idea that we still need a theory of permanent evolution in order to contradict Stalinist stages theories. Now, the problem with this is that, actually, I don't think anyone has a stages theory any longer. Very few people actually think there's anything beyond capitalism. And even when people like um, Garcia Lanera in Bolivia say the possibility of socialism at some point in the future, a hundred years in the future, or a thousand years in the future, you know, he's not really talking about achieving socialism. You know, this is, this is like Ramsay MacDonald, you know, or something, if in a thousand years' time we might actually get to this point. Nobody believes this. And in fact, the ANC are probably more honest about this than simply saying, yeah, this is it, capitalism, that's all we've got. Have some reforms, possibly, you know, we're not shooting down miners or whatever, but, you know, basically, um, that's, this is it. And, and that's the attitude. So the idea, the old Stalinist lie, because they never had a real intention of going through several stages, but the old Stalinist stages thing is gone. Um, so in a sense, there isn't anything to counterpose this to. What the argument is really about is whether well socialism is possible at all. Um, now, four final points and I will conclude. What are the alternatives in revolutionary situations today? There seems to be four. One is barbarism, and this has happened in large parts of Central Africa. Simply the collapse of the state, the inability of anyone to actually coherently put together some kind of, some kind of social structure and, and things falling to bits. That's happened in some places. The second is outright counter-revolution, um, and that can be a temporary thing. And Look at Bahrain or places like that, here in, in the Gulf states particularly, where the most recent revolutionary movements were simply defeated. But I don't think that's a stable situation. I don't think the old quasi-absolutist regimes are going to last much longer. I mean, maybe five years, maybe ten, whatever, but they will collapse. So counter-revolution in that sense, uh, in the sense of simply preserving the existing order as it was, I think is only a stopgap operation that isn't going to last. Which leaves you with two, two possible alternatives. One is an actual successful socialist revolution based on the working class and its allies and the peasantry and so on. But the, the other alternative is, and this is what I started with, is simply a continuation of different kinds of political revolution. Now, there's a famous article by Lenin um, called The Crisis in Social Democracy, which I'm sure you all know and could probably chant after me, where he says, what is the basis of a revolution? A revolution is where the ruling class cannot go on in the old way, and the working class will not go on uh, in, in the old way. Now, there's an important uh, clause here, which Lenin is very aware of. It's very true that the ruling class can't go on sometimes in the old way, but it can go on in a new way. It can find, find some other way of going on, possibly by getting rid of its immediately offensive sections of, you know, Mubarak or whatever, and find some other group of people to go in their place and rule instead. And if the working class doesn't win, that is what is going to happen. It's the alternative to what... So in a sense, what we're talking about is a set of alternatives here. And I think that's the way to look at it, rather than thinking about deflections and so on. It's simply an alternative set of positions. Are we going to have socialist revolutions, or are we going to have a series of political revolutions which rejuggle juggle the ruling class? That seems to be the context for the periods we're talking about and the challenges that's in front of us. I think it's good to approach the um, wave of revolutionary upheavals that have developed in the Arab world but that are having global echoes from a historical perspective. Not necessarily that of a thousand years but certainly from the perspective of the whole series of revolutionary experiences that have unfolded since 17, 1789. Now, um, I this isn't the focus of what I want to say, but I, I do want to say in the light of what I understand to be the nature of those experiences, I don't really agree with what Neil said about deflected permanent revolution. Um, and I just want to say something briefly uh, uh, about that. I mean, I think um, Neil's de devoted uh, 800 pages to writing a book about bourgeois revolutions, which is really... Uh, important, and I recommend that people read, but it's important to be clear what a bourgeois revolution is. A bourgeois revolution is a revolution that creates the political conditions for the development of capital accumulation in a, in a, particular, in a particular country. Um, permanent revolution is what becomes a, a possibility when you have a globally integrated capitalist system which means that the kind of pressures for bourgeois revolution in a particular society, usually dominated by imperialism, um, um, potentially fuse with, because of the effect of capitalism on that society with the, the development of independent 
working class struggle that then opens up the possibility of a revolution that doesn't simply break usually the hold of imperialism, the problem for the local bourgeoisie or would, would be, be bourgeoisie, but would uh, overthrow capitalism all, altogether. In the case of de deflected permanent revolution, what we have is a class, usually of the clerks of the imperial order, like Cabral, who Neil talked about, who initiate that, um, that revolutionary process, build broad popular alliances, and where successful, do precisely create the political conditions for capital accumulation in the sense of a process of capital accumulation which is, they hope, controlled w within the country itself in the era where these processes mainly took place after the, the sec Second World War, uh, producing a version of, of state capitalism. So I think that we're talking about something significantly more than mere political revolutions, we're talking about a particular kind of bourgeois revolution, social revolution. Sorry, that's a deviation from what I intended to say, but I, I feel that um, uh, Neil, uh, what Neil said was so provocative that uh, it couldn't simply be ignored. Um, but I want, to, I want to go back to what the focus of what I wanted to say, which is that why, why is it important to put the present revolutionary upheavals in a historical context. In part, it's for reasons of principle. Lukács said that Marxists always read the present as history. In other words, we read what happens in the present as shaped, not simply shaped by the past, but um, enacting in a way that both repeats but also goes beyond past historical processes. And we need to do that in the case of the, uh, in the, case of the revolution re-upheavals that began in the Arab world. But I think there also have been more political, immediate political reasons why, um, in our tradition, um, we've tended to emphasise um, the historical continuities in the case, for example, of the revolutions in, in Egypt, Tunisia and, and Syria and so on. And that's because the dominant discourse about these revolutions um, vacillates between two poles. One pole is that of absolute no novelty. Not absolute novelty on a world level, but in the case of the region. These are liberal revolutions seeking to produce versions of the kind of neoliberal capitalism that exist in the, in the, in the, in the West, um, but organised and coordinated and directed through new, new social media. That's the dominant narrative. Uh, that helps to explain why the Obama administration has reacted to the um, rats in places like Libya and Egypt with a tone of injury. You know, these are our revolutions. How dare you, um, you know, demonstrate against us and kill our ambassador and that, that kind of thing. We own these revolutions. That's one pole. The other pole is the Islamophobic pole, the danger that this is all just going to be swept away um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a wave of Islamic re reaction. That's the dominant way of presenting um, the, the, the revolutions, but there's a, a also a left version of that, which again vacillates between absolute novelty and Islamophobia. In this in this case, the absolute novelty is understood in autonomous terms. So if you read Michael Hart and Tony Negri's recent pamphlet declaration, it's all about the Arab revolutions plus the 15th of May movement in the Spanish state, plus Occupy as cases of purely horizontal struggles that don't need parties or trade unions or any old-style left organisation and so, so on and so forth. That's the pole of absolute novelty. The other pole is frankly Islamophobic, fear of sort of dark Islamist reaction coming to dominate as a, as a result of the, the revolutions. Now, I think that in the face of these, I think, really quite, quite bankrupt approaches, we've been right to, right to stress the con continuities between the present upheavals and classical revolutionary processes, going back to the French Revolution, but also 
encompassing the era of the Russian Revolution and, and so on. And what particular, I just want to identify some of the key elements in, that, in what we've stressed. First of all, um, revolutions as products of wars and or economic, economic crises. In the case of the Arab revolutions, we, it's essential to see them as a product of the way in which the crisis exacerbated the class polarization and impoverishment created by the implementation of neoliberalism in the, in the region. And one element that I, th I think it's important to stress here is the way in which neoliberalism in much of the global south doesn't lead to the kind of neutral market economy that is uh, central to neoliberal ideology, but leads to a fusion of economic and political power, a new version of the kind of fusion that existed in the old state capitalist period, say, under, under Nasser or the elder a Assad, in the sense that neoliberalism means, among other things, privatisation. <laughs> Who benefits from that pri privatisation? The cronies of the ruling regime or even the ruling family. And one of the really interesting things uh, is that we don't ju just see this in Egypt or in Tunisia, we also see it in Syria. Under the younger Assad, we did see a neoliberal restructuring of Syria, which, is, as John Maunder in his article in International Socialism showed, produced precisely um, the um, processes of impoverishment and elite looting of the privatised assets, which, 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 which have also been crucial to, to revolutions and, and, and in, in other parts of the, the, re the region. The second element we've stressed is that the drive is struggled from below and we've in particular highlighted the importance of the workers' movement in, the, in these processes in a way that the dominant discourse tends to ignore. We've applied, we've seen these revolutions as what Trotsky called, this is a third feature, processes of successive appro approximation. In other words, learning processes in which the masses, through the experience of struggle, um, try out different political so solutions, and as they fail, um, move in a more and more radical direction. And we can see this very clearly in Egypt, starting off with, after the fall of Mubarak, with the idea that the army and the people are united, to a situation by the end of last year, where a substantial minority identi identified SCAF, identified the military as the, um, as the enemy. This is a, these are unfinished processes, of course, of course, but we can see that nevertheless. And finally, the primacy of politics. In other words, as Neil stressed, revolutions, whatever their basic character, are struggles over the state and over, over state, state power. The kind of lyrical rejection of the state that you find in the writings of people like John Holloway and Hart and Negri, change the world without t taking power, avoids the way in which, in a revolutionary situation, the focus of struggle is around the state, state power, winning it, breaking it, in the case of a socialist revolution, creating a different kind of state, and revolutionary strategy and tactics have systematically to be bent in the light of an understanding of the centrality of the state, uh, the primacy of, of politics. Now, I think that we were right to stress these continuities, but I think it's also important to talk about the discontinuities. Um, and I want to do so by um, invoking the, the, um, the focus of the book whose 25th anniversary we're remembering, Revolutionary Rehearsals, because the collection of, of essays that Colin edited, that Colin brought together in that, that book, are essentially focused on uh, mass upheavals, proto-revolutionary upheavals, alas, not successful revolutions, certainly in producing so socialist revolutions, um, that took place during the last great upturn, the upturn of the late 60s and early 1970s, 
which in the case of the so-called newly industrialising countries, that's what they used to be called, it's, they're now whatever the emergent market economies, we can see stretching beyond the period that, where the uh, upturn unfolded primarily in the advanced capitalist countries, the late 60s and early 70s, well into the 1980s. If we think about the Iranian Revolution, if we think about solidarity in, in Poland, if we um, see the, if we look at the mass workers' struggles that produced the Kutch, the Independent Union Federation, and then the Workers' Party in, in Brazil, if we look at the mass workers and township risings that were crucial in forcing the end of apartheid in South Africa, and if finally we look at the mass strikes and student demonstrations that in 1987-88 um, broke the military dictatorship in, in, in South Korea. Now, it's important when we look at that wave of struggles to see who the protagonist of those struggles were. Primarily, centrally, it was the working class, but not the working class in the abstract, but a very definite kind of working class. The working class produced by what historians often call the second industrial revolution. The industrial revolution that begins at the end of the 19th century and that leads to the development of industries like uh, electricity, chemicals, and in particular, auto, particular car manufacture. Because if you look at these struggles again and again, at the, at, the, at the heart of them are car workers, not always, of course, they're the shipyard workers who initiated the struggle of solidarity in, in Poland. There, <coughs> I, I've never forgotten a photograph of women steel workers demonstrating during the, uh, the strikes in South Korea in 19, 1987. But nevertheless, what we're talking about is a working class formed in big industrial plants where often the centre of militancy was the auto industry. And I think <coughs> we can see these upheavals as the culmination of a cycle of struggle that really starts in the 1930s with some of the most important mass struggles provoked by the Great Depression. <coughs> For example, the um, unionisation of basic industry in the, in, the, um, in the United States in the mid-1930s. This is the historical moment at which places like Detroit or Biancourt, the centre of the most important plant of the Renault car com company, become the key reference points for the power of organised workers in those, in, in those countries. And we see mass working class organisations both trade unions and um, political parties, traditional political parties, playing an absolutely central role. Now, of course, a central part of the, the dynamic of this period of upheavals is the emergence of a new revolutionary left, or the expansion of a new revolutionary left, um, that seeks to challenge the dominance of the traditional workers, workers' parties. And again and again, there's an interaction, a challenge, challenge and response, one might call it, in the words of Arnold, to Arnold Toynbee, um, between the, the new revolutionary left and the traditional reformist parties, most importantly the, the, um, the communist parties, in, certainly in Western, Western, Western Europe. Uh, in some cases, these struggles create the very mass organisations. This is true of solidarity in Poland, of um, Kutch, the Kutch and the Workers' Party in Brazil, Casato in South Africa, the K Korean Confederation of Trade Unions. But nevertheless, even if they're a product of these struggles, these organisations dominate and shape and provide the framework of the, the movements in different countries. Now, the situation is, is really different now. Uh, it's not that the, the traditional workers' organisations uh, have, have disappeared, but they're weakened, and often the, the dominant forces in them uh, don't even pretend to articulate workers' militancy, but operate as a conservative force. Um, the most striking contemporary example of this 
is the Marikana strike in, in South Africa, a strike vehemently opposed by, by NUM, the National Union of Mine Workers, which isn't any old union in South Africa. The emergence of NUM organising workers in, black workers in the key industry in South Africa, then as now, was a critical moment in the development of the independent workers' movement in South Africa in the, in the, the 1980s. The national strike that Nung mounted in 1987 was a key episode in, well, in what turned to be the defeat of those wave of struggles, which forced um, the movement to follow the ANC into making a, making a compromise with the apartheid regime that saved capitalism in, 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 in South Africa. So Nung isn't any old union, and the fact that we now have it opposing uh, workers who were till recently its own members and supporting a state that shoots them down is an illustration of, of how things have, have, have changed. I want to emphasise in saying that, I'm not saying that existing workers' organisations are corrupt and need to be abandoned or, or, or anything, anything like that. Part of the complexity in the situation in South Africa is revolutionaries have still to relate to the mass of organised workers who are in the established unions inside Kasatu, um, as well as those who are, are breaking away from them. Now, so, but if we turn back to the revolutionary wave, if we look, say, at the workers' movement in Egypt, of course they played a very important role. The rise of the workers' movement was critical to creating the conditions for the 25th of January revolution in e Egypt last, last year. The strike wave that developed in early February 2011 delivered the death blow to Mubarak, forced the White House and the military to remove him to try and restabilize this, the, 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 the situation. And since uh, the fall of Mubarak, there have been an important series of strike waves, and there's one going on at the present time. Nevertheless, the workers' movement, uh, including the new independent unions that have emerged in Egypt since the, the revolution, since the fall of Mubarak, have not um, decisively shaped the political scene in, in e Egypt. The leaders of the independent unions have found it hard to mobilize their members around, around political issues. The, process of radicalization that I described taking place in Egypt, involving the emergence of a big revolutionary minority that's opposed to the, the state, uh, opposed to the military, includes lots and lots of workers. Uh, it's a predominantly working class movement, but its focus is the street, not the workplace. And this helps to explain why this revolutionary minority have been attracted towards forms of ultra-left politics, the, for example, the politics of boycotting the elections, uh, successive elections, when, in particular, the presidential ele uh, elections provided a crucial arena for gathering together the forces necessary to block the attempt by the military to <coughs> maintain, maintain power. And this, is, this situation, the... Um, the fact that the organised working class isn't central is associated with um, a more general weakness of the dominant forces on the left. Traditionally, the dominant forces of the left in Egypt have come from the Communist, Communist Party. They have disgraced themselves by um, an Islamophobia that has led many of those forces to side with Shafiq, the candidate of SCAF of the military, uh, against Morsi, the candidate of the Muslim Brotherhood, in the second round of the presidential elections. And we can see that's not just a <coughs> Egyptian or Arab peculiarity. Uh, going back to the case of South Africa, the general secretary of the South African Communist Party, Blade Nzimande, made a speech large, last week, uh, you know, which was a classic Stalinist speech, incidentally, uh, refuting what Neil said, articulating 
the, a stages theory of revolution, saying that South Africa is still in the phase of the national democratic revolution, which means that workers have to restrain themselves and so on and so forth, and denouncing the strike wave that has gripped the mining industry of South Africa as a middle class movement backed by sections of imperialism. An interesting idea, given the historic role of the great mining companies in uh, the functioning of imperialism in South Africa, but never mind. <coughs> so what we're, what we're seeing is the development of new revolutionary processes in a situation where the organized working class that was central to Collins' revolutionary rehearsals has been weakened, and weakened both by explicit defeats, but more fundamentally by the continuous relentless process of neoliberal restructuring over the, over the past generation, and where many sections, the dominant sections of the left, have declined in strength and whatever ideological and political power they have over the last, last period. And insofar as these revolutionary processes uh, don't fit the models of the past, I think it's primarily because of this, this central, central fact. Now, the conclusions that one should draw from this aren't one gloom and doom, uh, it's not going to happen because the workers still haven't forced their way into the, the leadership of the revolutionary process and the left has proved pretty crap and things like that. And it's certainly not an argument for uh, ideas that seek simply to bypass the organised working class, the traditional working class movement, movement and sense uh, um, in general because there uh, is enormous power concentrated in, in the organised working class as it exists and is developing in, the, in uh, the case of these revolutionary experiences. But it means that what we're seeing is simultaneously a process of the, the renewal of the revolutionary tradition, new revolutions. I mean, those of us who can remember the uh, 200th anniversary of the French Revolution, which coincided, of course, with the fall of the Stalinist regimes in 1989, will remember the way in which part of the dominant discourse is, well, the French Revolution was important and all that, but revolution is no longer part of the historical agenda. It's not, it's an idea whose time is past and so on. What we're seeing is the opposite, a renewal of the revolutionary tradition, but one central element in that renewal is a renewal, restructuring, recreation of the workers' movement and as part of that, of the, of the left. And that's really the, 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 the challenge that I think confronts revolutionaries in the, in the, present, in the present situation. I mean, in, a, in very tough ways, in the countries at the centre of the, of, of the revolutionary pro processes, but, for, but, but for, for all of us. And there's plenty of scope for both experiment and innovation in these situations. The, the scripts of past periods of struggle aren't going to automatically translate to these new revolutionary experiences. But that doesn't alter the importance of setting, setting these struggles in a larger historical context and um, continuing to see the continuities not out of, um, you know, not for the sake of just sort of confirming some particular view of the world or, or whatever, but because they matter concretely. Those of us who've been following the Egyptian revolution closely have been struck by the similarities, despite many differences, in the challenges facing revolutionaries in Egypt today with the challenges that faced the uh, very young Communist Party in Germany after the overthrow of the Kaiser in November 1980, the temptations of boycotting elections, of ultra-leftism, the urgent uh, pressures to create revolutionary organisation that can begin to relate to the, the mass of workers, the kind of tactical problems that, um, that confront revolutionaries day by day. All of that, it's, you know, the, the echoes 
but between um, um, the echoes of Germany at the end of the First World War that one sees in Egypt today are, are, very, are very striking. So it, what we have to do is to, um, is to recognise what's distinctive about the present period, but at the, to do so that doesn't lose sight, not simply the historical context, but of the historical experiences that may, remain of relevance to the present.